Market. Hello and welcome to the Capital Market Slide. I'm Alvin Lam, Managing Director of International Markets at Gini Mae. Today, I am joined by Stephen Abraham, Senior Managing Director and Head of Investment Strategy at Amherst Pierpont Securities. Before joining Amherst Pierpont, he served as co-founder and the CEO of Milepost Capital Management. And as a director of MTGE Investment Corporation, he also held senior positions at Deutsche Bank, Bear Stearns, and Morgan Stanley. Steve holds a PhD from Columbia University and has taught at Columbia Business School. He is now leading a team advising institutional investor in rates, financing markets, corporate credit, and securitized products. So welcome, Steve. Alvin, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Pleasure having you. I want to start talking about the health of the FHJ capital funds. Ginny Mae and the Federal Housing Administration continue to play active roles in maintaining a healthy housing market during the COVID pandemic. The FHJ capital ratio is one indicator of the health of the FHA MMI, or Mutual Mortgage Insurance Fund. Steve, some of our audience of MBS investors may not familiar with the, uh, the broad approach FHA takes to estimating capital. Can you explain how does FHA calculate this capital? Uh, sure, Alvin. It really is a critical number for FHA, and it turns out it's also a critical number for MBS investors too. So as you indicated, the agency just put out its latest annual report on the MMI fund, and that's really where capital comes into play. Uh, FHA uses its capital to pay claims on insured mortgage loans, and Congress requires FHA to hold capital. It has to hold at least 2% of the equivalent of 2% of insured mortgage principal. And that's important because if capital falls below that, the agency may have to go back to Congress uh, for more funds, which is not something I suspect FHA or HUD would consider fun. But then for MBS investors, FHA capital can influence the level of uh, mortgage insurance premiums. And MIPS can obviously have a pretty big impact on prepayment. So that's why I think it's worth talking about and really understanding, at least in some modest detail. So the capital calculation really has three main pieces. Uh, the first piece is the capital that's already available to FHA. You can almost think of that as money in the bank. The second piece is the present value of future mortgage insurance premiums. So that's the money that FHA may be receiving at some point in the future from its portfolio of loans. And then the third piece is the present value of any future losses. So if loans default and there's a loss on the loan, what does the present value of that potential risk looks like? So capital really is a simple piece of arithmetic. It's capital plus premiums minus losses. And that's the money that ultimately becomes available to FHA and that constitutes FHA capital. So certainly at a high level, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. Thank you, Steve, for the detailed explanation of the calculation of FHA capital. The, the capital ratios rise this year. Can you explain the main reason and what does that implies? Yeah, so between September of 2020, uh, obviously, we had already started into the pandemic at that point. And uh, the end of September 2021, uh, capital went up by about $21.5 billion. And the capital ratio actually went up as well from roughly 6.1% to just over 8%. Now, that might seem a little surprising considering that we were in the midst of pandemic with all of the ups and downs that entailed. but capital amount and the capital fund came out of it, at least out of fiscal 21, very healthy. So a big chunk of that increase, about $8.3 billion, came from a drop in projected losses. Home price appreciation has been incredibly strong, uh, not just 
last year, but for a couple of years. And the losses on homes where FHA borrowers default, those losses continue to drop. So, for example, in 2011, for every dollar of defaulted loan principal, the FHA lost about 64 and a half cents. But if you looked at fiscal 21, that loss dropped to only 35 and a half cents. So home price appreciation has made FHA's insured portfolio of loans much safer, and that has significantly cut its loss expectations. That has been a big reason for the projected health of the FHA insurance fund. Most of the rest of the increase, about $13 billion, came from a larger balance of, of capital already available to FHA at the start of its fiscal 21 year. And that larger balance, too, came partly from lower actual losses in the last year. So home price appreciation has been a really a tremendous and probably surprising source of capital support for FHA's operations. Glad to hear that. I want to follow up with your numbers and your answers. How sensitive is the uh, capital calculation to assumptions about interest rates and home price appreciation? Both are, are actually uh, pretty important. The interest rates and the interest rate assumptions drive prepayments, and that clearly has a big influence on the amount of mortgage insurance premium that the FHA is able to collect on you know, the loans that remain outstanding over time. And then home price appreciation clearly drives defaults and losses. The MMI does a very nice job of showing how sensitive its projections are, and as a result, how sensitive FHA capital is to those assumptions. So the MMI report shows that if rates drop by 1% or 100 basis points, the capital ratio would drop by 42 basis points. So prepayments would pick up, more loans would disappear, the stream of premiums would drop, and that would reduce the capital ratio by the indicated amount. On the other hand, if HPA drops by 1%, the capital ratio would drop by 126 basis points. So basically, FHA capital is three times as sensitive to the HPA assumption as it is to the interest rate assumption. And that turns out to be very important, I think, to the way FHA is thinking about its current capital ratio and what it may be doing in the future. Thank you, Steve. Let's talk about the importance of the capital ratios to our investors. In your view, why are Gini May MBS investors interested in FHA capital ratios? Well, in one word, history. In the past, FHA has adjusted its uh, insurance premiums based on the capital ratios, and that has had a big impact on prepayments. So, for example, from 2008 through 2013, Really, throughout the Great Recession and its aftermath, FHA raised insurance premiums to rebuild capital. And then after its capital balances looked a lot better, FHA then turned around and reduced its insurance premiums. And both of those things, both the higher insurance premiums from 2008 through 2013, and then the reduction in insurance premiums a few years later had a big impact on prepayments. And that's obviously really at the center of what concerns MBS investors. So it's really that concern about prepayment risk more than credit risk that, that draws investors' attention to the capital ratio and what it might mean for MIPS. Thank you for sharing these positive messages, especially from your historic uh, perspective. Steve, do you have any uh, thoughts on how FHA might use its capital surplus? Yeah, so it's very likely FHA will use some of that surplus to reduce insurance premiums. The tricky thing is the timing, the magnitude, and also where those subsidies in a way could be targeted. And it's likely that it might be different from what we've seen historically. For one thing, the MMI report 
report is pretty clear that FHA is concerned about the amount of seriously delinquent loans that are still sitting around at this point in the pandemic. I think FHA is also concerned about home prices after the significant run-up of the last few years. For example, again, a history lesson, FHA had plenty of capital in 2007 and then was, was hit with the Great Recession and a few years later really found itself undercapitalized. So I think that probably limits any big across-the-board cut in MIPS. And I'd say the final thing is FHA clearly wants to find ways to increase home ownership, especially for first-time home buyers. That's viewed as a key way to build wealth. So some of the surplus is likely to be used to subsidize programs that target that niche, as well as uh, some other you know, traditionally underserved communities. So I think we're looking for a modest cut in MIP starting perhaps mid-2022 with targeted subsidies along the way. Thank you for this very thoughtful advice. Well, it looks like that is all the time we have for today. With that, Steve, thank you for your time and sharing thoughts inside on the uh, FSJ MMI funds and the report to Congress. Thanks, Alvin. It's, it's good to be with you. That was Stephen Abrahams, Senior Managing Director and Head of Investment Strategy from Amherst Pierpont Securities. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe our future episodes of Capital Markets Live on YouTube. If you have any comments or questions about today's episode or other topics, please send us an email at ocmglobalinvestorinquiries at hot.gov. Again, the email is ocmglobalinvestorinquiries at hud.gov. Again, thank you for listening. 